Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the meetings we've been having since Wednesday night. We praise your name because you brought us thus far in the journey. And Father, we are praying that as we conclude this morning, you will bless every one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray that you give us the grace, the strength, the power, so that we will keep faithful to your word till the end in Jesus' name. Amen. We have started the race with you. And we are praying that you will help us to continue till the very end. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. We thank the Lord who has led us thus far in the journey. And he has led us thus far in the program that we started since Wednesday night. Already we have heard much from the word of God since we came. We exposed you to the word of God concerning our fallow ground. And if you still remember, I did emphasize that God spoke to the children of Israel in a language they could understand. And he told them that it will be necessary, in fact compulsory, to break up the fallow ground so that they will not sow the seed, the seed of truth, the seed of righteousness, and the seed that will lead into life eternal among thorns, but that the hardened ground, the fallow ground, the tilled but not sown ground will be broken up, dug deep, and will be turned over so that now the word, the seed of truth, will be sown in there. And if you have done that, and you have started seeking the Lord, so that he will rain righteousness upon you, until you are totally flooded, saturated, with the experience of righteousness, then the seed would have been sown very well in your heart. Then we spoke about the flesh and the spirit. And you saw very clearly, if we are born of God, we are totally different from the people that are of the world. That if we are of the spirit, that the flesh will not overcome us. And then we learned that if we are going to see the Lord, be with the Lord, at last, we must have clean hands and a pure heart. And I told you, it is not either or, it is both and. It is not that well if you have clean hands and you don't have a pure heart, you've got 50% of the whole thing. Or if you've got a pure heart, but you've not got clean hands, you've got 50%, you must have both. Before you will be able to see the Lord. That without that... Everything you do, everything you may be on earth here, will be a total waste. And yesterday morning, we talked on trusting in the Lord, not trusting in man. And the various areas of trusting in man that people have gotten into now, I exposed to you. And it is very necessary as you are going back home. That those things you have heard will not just be a message on paper. It will be the word of God that is planted in your very heart and in your very life. Because if we do not take that to heart, that we are not to trust in man. We are to trust in the Lord and in the Lord alone. A lot of problems will crop up in our lives, in our families, and in our churches. But it is as we trust in the Lord all the time, leaning upon him, depending upon him. He supplies all the needs that we have in our lives because he honors faith. I mean real faith. Not just faith for healing, not just faith for other things, but 
faith that will follow after the Lord every time, in every situation, in every experience of life, that you totally, completely rely, lean, trust in Him. And so please remember that we are not to trust in man. And especially as I emphasized to you, that we do not trust in the rich, we do not trust in the people that may be above, the rest of the people in the community or in the church. We just trust in the Lord and in the, in the Lord alone. Not only that, we have heard from the word of God that we should keep to the standard of the word of God. Because if we do not keep to the standard of the word of God, we'll be running all about. Somebody is doing something there, you want to be there. Another one is doing something over there, you want to be there. But fight the good fight of faith. All those tendencies in you, all the disposition in you that will want to do your own will, go your own way, fight against those things. I told you, those who will inherit the kingdom of God from the very beginning of the Christian race, they must have been fighting against all the tendencies that will pull them back. Your mind, your flesh, and your relatives, and unbelievers around you, relatives and friends around you, they will not like you to do things according to the word of God, but fight against anything that will get you back into the world again. Last night, you listened to the message on power, and it was very well outlined you must have pardon before purity. And you must have purity before power. That if your sins have not been forgiven, if you have not been pardoned, if you have not been forgiven, that then it means that you cannot be seeking after wanting to have power. The way you start your Christian race, your Christian journey, is that you come for pardon first. You come for the peace of mind. You come for the experience of salvation. And after that, you tell the Lord you need to be purified in your heart. Purified within you. So that you do not remain double-minded with impure heart, with unsanctified heart, and with a heart in which the Adamic nature has not been uprooted. But you seek after the Lord after you have been born again. So that He will sanctify you. And it is after sanctifying you that you go to the Lord in prayer and you tell the Lord he should baptize you in the Holy Ghost. Being baptized in the Holy Ghost is not crying. It is not shouting. It is not repeating what you have heard from a particular pastor in speaking in tongues or what you have heard from your neighbor or from the people that pray around you. It is not what you have picked up from the prayer warriors it is the real power of God coming upon your life. And the speaking in tongues is just the initial evidence. And it is not the greatest thing in connection with the baptism in the Holy Ghost. It's the power that gets you, that makes you to understand you have been filled with the Holy Ghost. Power to pray. Power to witness. Power to stand. Power in understanding the word of God and being able to obey the word of God. And so it is very important that all these things we have heard from the very beginning of this workers' retreat, take them to heart and say, Lord, I will not lose anything at all. And yet you need to understand this. That it is not all those who start the race that are eventually crowned or commended. It is those who finish up the race that will be crowned. It is something to start, but the real thing you are looking after is to finish it up. No, um, I think that in your own state, in your local church, you would have seen a lot of people that started with us, that started with Christ, that started in the grace of God by the Spirit of the Lord, but you will find that they're no more there. And you can count them one by one. You can say, I remember so and so. He used to be fiery. Used to be consistent. Used to be trustworthy. And used to be dependable. But now, no more in the fold. 
and you can remember so and so those years used to go out with evangelism with us and used to be very consistent always there never getting late to the meeting unfortunately at the time she was going to get married she is nowhere to be found now she has gone away she has backslidden you can remember so and so used to preach in the retreat maybe in the local retreat or in the state retreat but now it's nowhere to be found it's in a shed somewhere in a corner somewhere is following after people that are not following after sound doctrine you can remember oh so and so will remember so well a, a, a great challenge to people in the house fellowship system a great challenge to the people of god but because of a little problem in the church he has turned back he has looked back and the bible does say that when you have laid your hands on the plow and you look back you are no more fit for the kingdom of god and we see a lot of people they appear to have laid everything on the altar before you if you remember they are preaching very well they will say not even a devil can get me out of this place i love christ i love my church this is my church we're going to go all the way through they made the consecration of ruth your god will be my god and your people will be my people god do so to me and more also if aught but death part you and me they, they were people that were thought they had made up their minds. They were going to follow the Lord all the way through. But even though they made a consecration of Ruth, they did not have the lifestyle of Ruth. Now you see that we don't find them anymore. We only hear stories about them. We only hear bad, bad things about them. They have not been able to sail through. Temptation came, they fell. Confusion came, they fell misunderstanding came they fell chastisement came they fell discipline came they fell and some erroneous doctrines came their way they fell for it now they have gone like judas like demas like saul the first king uh, of israel they have all gone but here are we today we have started the race and the important thing is that we should finish it off that's why I need to talk to you before you, event, before you go to your locations. Enduring till the end. Enduring till the very end. You have started. It's good to finish. In Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14 verse 28. For which of you intending to build a tower? Seated not down first and counteth the cost whether he have sufficient to finish it lest haply after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish it all that behold it begin to mock him saying this man began to build and was not able to finish the angels of God in their millions and myriads are looking at you. They're looking at every pilgrim from earth to heaven, from Jericho to Jerusalem, to the new Jerusalem, from Babylon back to the promised land. The angels of God are looking at the people that have started in the race. They have heard the announcement of the king that this is not your home. You have been sad as you have been in the land of captivity. And as the strange people have told you, sing the Lord of Zion. Sing the song of Zion in the land that is strange. You have hung your pipes or your violins, your vows on the tree. And you have been crying. How shall we sing the song of the Lord in the land of strangers? And eventually the announcement came to you. All of you that have a willing mind, a ready heart, the call has come. The way, the gate to the land of promise is now open. You can go back to your land. And your heart has been wandering. Your heart has been panting. After that, because you desire to make heaven at last. You want to be in the land of promise at last. And you have started on your journey. You gave your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And as you gave your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, you left Babylon. You left Egypt. You left all the places where you had been in bondage under the iron yoke. 
and now you are following the captain the captain of your salvation the redeemer as we are on the journey all the hosts of heaven they are watching and if you have started and eventually you do not finish up everyone will begin to mock and say and say see that man see that woman she started he started but he's not able to finish it up that is the reason why you should consider count the cost before you go let me tell you there will be persecution count the cost before you go let me tell you there will be distractors there will be detractors that will come to you and will say i was there before i was in that church before i was following after that before i used to believe all that before there will be detractors that will come to you count the cost there will be people that are backsliders that will come to you and will say well i used to live like that also sober vigilant following the lord slowly and deliberately and they will try to tell you but now i have slided back now i have gone back now i have looked back well you tell them if you have looked back you are no more fit for the kingdom i want to be fit for the kingdom tell them if you have turned back your, your hands were on the plow before you were among the working team before you were among the people that were pushing on before but you are no more there well i want to be there myself because if you have looked back you are no more fit for the kingdom don't make me like you are don't make me unfit for the kingdom like you are you tell them that so that they will not detract you from all from the way you ought to follow it's jesus said you must count the cost so that you will know that the lord has called you you are following after the lord and you will not allow anything anyone to send you back it may be that they will say well you are not married yet that's why you are so uh, fervent that's why you are pushing on that's why you are following the doctrine as they are teaching us but you see when i wanted to get married uh, i didn't know it was difficult like that in trying to pay dowry in trying to get uh, to that family or in trying to even get an answer from the sister or in trying to get the brother i will get married to and eventually i saw that the way is very hard well if your way is hard you are a transgressor the bible says the way of the transgressor is hard the way of the children of God is full of the grace of God, full of the Spirit of God, is full of the help of the Lord, is full of anointing from above. The way of the children of God is made easy by the cross. It is the cross and the sword of the word that paves the way for them. And we just go on. When we are climbing mountain, we don't feel the hardness because we fly up like eagles. We mount up like eagles. Eagles don't say it is hard to fly, it is hard to mount up, and you know, they will come and they will tell you, you see, it is very, very hard. I tried to dress like they taught us, it was hard. I tried to get married like they taught us, it was hard. I tried to get work like they taught us, it was hard. The way of the transgressor is hard. But if you are a child of God, you will cross mountains and mount up with wings of eagles. It will not be hard for you. The Lord, the Master, will be going before you. He will handle you. He will lay hold on your hand. He will say, give me your hand. My grace is sufficient for you. But you see all these people, they come back and they tell us, Oh, it is hard. I cannot follow after that. Well, you tell them I can follow. I've got the grace. I got it from God. I got it from Christ. I got it from heaven. And don't discourage me. I want to keep on following. If you do not make up your mind like that, it will be difficult to endure until the end. When we talk about enduring till the end, it means that you will follow the word of the Lord until the end. You will follow the word until the end. You make up your mind. It doesn't matter what is going on. I'm rebuked. I'm following on. I am corrected, I am following on. I am chastised and disciplined, I am following on. Whatever may be happening in the location, whatever may be happening in the state, I am following on so that I can endure until the end. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, from verse 1. Now therefore, hearken, O Israel, 
unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you, for to do them, that ye may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth you. Let's remember the people that will possess their possession, the land that God has promised, the place that Jesus Christ has gone to prepare. They will be the people that follow, that do what the word of God teaches. Now, therefore, hearken, listen, and do the doctrine, the word which I teach you, that you may live, that you may go in to possess the land. The evidence that we are going to possess the land is that we are following after the teaching of the word of God. There are people that tell us, oh, they say deeper life doesn't know how to worship. What they mean is that we don't raise up our hands and stand up and then be waving into the air and say, Jesus, I love you. We don't say that by word of mouth like the other people do. We say that with the life that we live. You see, when you follow the doctrines of the Bible, you are telling the Lord how much I love you. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. But you see all the other people, instead of keeping the commandments of the Lord, all that they do is that they raise up their hands, they wave their hands into the air. Jesus, you are Lord. Jesus, I adore you. Jesus, I love you. That's not that's lip service. But the people that really love the Lord, they are keeping the commandments of the Lord. But show me a man that is not able to follow the Lord. And then he comes to the uh, place of worship and he raises up the hand and he, you know, speaks whatever he wants to speak. And he says, Lord, I love you. Jesus, you are Lord. And he says, you see, since I left deeper life, what I have learned is how to worship the Lord. Now we really worship the Lord. When we were in deeper life, we were not worshipping the Lord. Who are you worshipping? You are worshipping Satan? When you were in deeper life? But to worship the Lord means that you follow after him in the beauty of holiness. In a life that is not stained. In a life that is not corrupted. And it is when you are following after the word of the Lord like that, you are worshipping the Lord. Don't you remember? God told the children of Israel, and he said, Bring no more vain oblation before me. I cannot away with it. All the things that you are doing, I cannot have them because your hands are full of blood. Your mouth is full of lies. Your heart is full of corruption. And your flesh is full of pollution. Get out of my sight. Those people are not worshipping God. The people that have immorality, that have sin in their lives, that are not obedient to the word of God. But you see, brothers and sisters, they will come to deceive you. And they will come to tell you, well, you deeper life people, you are not worshipping God. Oh, tell them that we do worship God. You see, in the morning, when you kneel down, you say, Lord, and you read the word of God. Not when you speak in tongues. You read the word of God and you nail yourself on the cross once again. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. The life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who died for me and gave himself for me. I do not prostrate the grace of God, but I'm willing to follow after so that I will be found in his righteousness. You see, when you wake up in the morning, you read the word of God, you say, Lord, today I want to follow after you. I will not lean to my own understanding. I will follow after you. When temptation comes, I will follow after you. That's worshipping the Lord. That's worshipping the Lord. I will obey you. I will love you. I will keep your word. Oh Lord, anything in my flesh, anything in my mind that will make me to go astray, cut it off from me, however painful, a right hand, a right eye, that will get me to sin, pluck it out, cut it off. That's worshipping the Lord. But you see the people that will not have quiet time, they will not read the Bible, they will not commit and consecrate themselves to following after the Lord and obeying the word of God and just raising up hands. Anybody can do that. Friends, don't let anybody deceive you. Don't let anybody distract your attention or, you know, point you to another way and divert you. Go in the straight and the narrow way. Moses told the children of Israel, he said, listen, hearken. 
hear the word of God. All that I teach you, when you follow after that, it is then you will possess the land. And the major thing in the Christian life, you see, they tell us that the major thing in the Christian life now, it is not obedience to the word of God. They will say, we are from one era to the other. They will tell us the major thing at the time of Martin Luther is justification by faith. The major thing at the time of John Wesley was sanctification and holiness. Then they will say, we have discovered now the major thing for our own generation of believers is worship. It is not holiness. The major thing now for us in this generation, just like they had their major emphasis at the time of Martin Luther, major emphasis at the time of John Wesley, the major thing right now is that the church will learn to worship. And then they give a lot of illustrations, but they deceive the hearts of the simple. Friends, the major thing at all times, in any era, in any dispensation, the major thing has always been and will always be obedience to the word of God. The major thing is not faith for healing. The major thing is not faith for deliverance. The major thing is not worshipping the way they, they say it and raising up your hands and saying, Jesus, I love you. The major thing is not falling on the ground and rolling on the ground. The major thing has always been, will always be obedience to the word of God. Go into all nations and teach. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Teaching them all things whatsoever I have commanded you that they must observe to do it. And he says, lo, I am with you always until the end of the world. The major thing until the end of the world is teaching them to observe. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. In verse 2. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you. Neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. Here the word of God is telling us, if you are going to endure till the end, don't add. You see why people leave our means? Sometimes it says that uh, there is something burning within them. They want to add to the word of God an experience. They want to add how they feel. They want to add some things that will minister to the flesh. And because over here we do not allow them to add that, we say just stand by the word of God. And they're so, they want to add that thing by all means. And because they want to add it, a little carelessness, a little frivolity, a little worldliness, a little copying of the world, a little freedom, little way of you know traveling where, wherever they like because they want to add to the word of god and over here we're always watching them always looking at what they are preaching always looking at how they are dressing always looking at how they are following the word of god always looking at their relationship between man and woman they say this is too much for me every time they watch every time they look every time they supervise every time they oversee every time they direct every time they control that's too much for me but don't you remember my brother, my sister? In the Old Testament, everything that the high priest did, Moses got everything written down and said, Aaron, you are not free. You are only free to abide by the word of God. If you are going to sacrifice an animal upon the altar, this is how to do it. If you are going to apply the blood, the once he was to apply the blood, only once he was told. Seven times he was told. Other times he was told. The one he was to sprinkle the blood on the altar or upon the ear of the person that is making the sacrifice or in the tomb of the priest, he was told everything into detail. He wasn't allowed to go his way. Don't you remember that, that man Bazaliel? He had the spirit of God to build the tabernacle every little detail of the tabernacle he was told he was told this is how to build the tabernacle these are the dimensions these are the various things that you ought to do he wasn't allowed to have the freedom and use my common sense in building the tabernacle and even how they were to carry the ark of the covenant the rings they were to make all along the side how they were to carry it from one place to the other all the details they were told even the way they were to follow they were not allowed to use their scientific knowledge. 
they were not allowed to use the experience of the past, saying that, well, we know that Canaan is in that direction. We can take any direction we want. You see, friends, there are a lot of people today that they do not want to follow after. They say the regulations are too many. They say the addiction to the word of God is too much. Don't eat this, don't drink that, don't wear that, don't go that way, don't visit that one. They say, well, I will leave. After all, I'm still a Christian. No, sir. You are not a Christian when you take away from the word. You are not a Christian when you add to the word. Well, I don't mean that you cannot, be, you may be speaking in tongues after you have left the word. All that, you have learned that, and you have got that, that's in your system already. You can still be raising up your hand. You can still be saying, Hallelujah, praise the Lord. And you may dance in the spirit, and move in the spirit, and shake in the spirit, and sit in the spirit, and look in the spirit, and bend your head, like they say, in the spirit, and, you know, go gently, and, you know, shake somebody's hand, God bless you. And you may, you know, try to change your tone of voice and say, Praise the Lord. Just feel the presence of the Lord in this place. How many of you feel the presence of the Lord? The Spirit is moving over there. And it's moving over there. And it's Don't you feel it? Don't you feel it? Don't you feel it? the Spirit of God? Now we can do all that and not have the Spirit of God at all. And leave the Word. The Word of God. That we don't teach restitution anymore. And they say, you know, since I left that deeper life, you know, the Spirit is just moving all over me. I feel it in my body. I feel it in my heart. feel it in my soul. Everywhere I go, I just move in the Spirit. Don't listen to them. They're deceiving you. Once you leave the Word of God, you have left the Spirit of God as well. All that remains, like our brother told us last night, is just the child. It's not gold. It's not the real thing. It's the brass. It's the imitation that people are bringing in. But it is when you know that I will not add to the word of God. But I will keep the word of God as it is. It is only then that we are really worshipping the Lord. It says in verse 3, Your eyes have seen what the Lord did because of Baal Peor. For all the men that followed Baal Peor. The Lord thy God has destroyed them from among you, but ye that cleave unto the Lord shall unto the Lord your God are alive, every one of you unto this day. I want you to see the word cleave. If you know your Bible very well, that is a central word that the Bible uses in marriage, that the wife will cleave to the husband. And the husband will cleave to the wife. Let me remind you what that word says. For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and cleave unto the wife. And they two shall become one. You know, sometimes I wonder for some of our preachers, when it may be in the local government, there is a little correction from the state capital. There is a little rebuke from the state capital. And they say, well, the eye of the state overseer is not uh, good to me anymore. He watches everything I do. They are watch don't, you, don't you read your Bible? It says they watch for your souls so that they may be able to give account. It says let them do it with joy and not with grief. Why do we have a state overseer if they cannot watch over you? Why do we have state overseer if they cannot oversee what do we call a person by a name? If he cannot do the duty attached to that name. But you see, there are people, once you watch over them, once you oversee them, once you supervise them, and uh, they say, well, uh, they are watching over me too much. They don't trust me. Oh, wait, why, why don't we trust you? If we didn't trust you, we'll not make you pastor. When I was at school, they trusted us. They gave us a laboratory and they gave us all the test tubes that we were used in performing the experiment. But all the time, even to our final year, the professor will still come and supervise. And the professor will, the professor will not say, well, you are about to graduate, you are about to you know, finish up, therefore no supervision. They supervised us every time. Don't you see, our boys, our, um, even some of the ladies now, they are studying engineering. 
eventually they graduate and as they graduate they go for their youth service and then they send them to a particular engineering company or they send them to the people that are building the roads while these engineers that are passed out from university while they're on the road working we have four men we have supervisors we have superintendents we have the directors that will still come and supervise them don't they have certificate have they not graduated do they not know the work do they not know the theory? Have they not done practical? Oh yes, they have done. Don't you see what happens? A nurse has gone to school. And a nurse has got all those things, all the certificate, all the experience, everything. And yet, even when it's, she's doing something, the nurse is told, you cannot make prescriptions for the people. Not even for fever. Not even for malaria. They will say, the doctor will make the prescription. And then... The nurse will tell the patient, this is what you are to buy. Uh -uh. If in the world, they supervise them among the medical profession. Even the people that have spent seven years in the, at the teaching hospital learning how to become a doctor. They, they cannot be allowed to do anything independently. We must, they must send them for housemanship. After they have gone for housemanship. And they have been exposed a lot. When they come to the hospital, the senior doctors are still supervising them. They don't rebel. They don't reject supervision. They don't reject watch, being watched over. Why is it you have spent five years in deeper life, we cannot watch over you? You have spent only seven years. You didn't even have theological uh, training. All that you have learned is what we have been teaching you for all these three days. How much can you learn in three days? The Bible is, you look at the Bible in your hand, it's big. You cannot learn everything in three days from Wednesday to Saturday morning. And therefore, after you have left, we put those overseers there. We say, well, they, our people, they love the Lord, but they, they can sometimes still be ignorant. They can make mistakes. So please help us oversee them. That's why we call them overseers. But some of us will not allow supervision. We do not want being overseen. But it says, the people that cleave unto the Lord, they are alive unto this day. To cleave to the Lord means that whether you are corrected as they oversee you, or you are chastised or disciplined as they oversee you, you will cleave unto the Lord. Now you see all the people that have left, and they have left us. The reason they left is that the supervision is too much. The overseeing is too much. Now my friend, why will they call me general superintendent if I'm not to supervise anything? If when the state overseers come, I'm not supposed to ask any question. If I ask question, the general superintendent is um, suspecting me. Doesn't he know I know what to do? I know you know what to do, but uh, you want me to be a figurehead? They just call me general superintendent. General. General means it's not just Lagos State superintendent. It means it is not just or your state superintendent. It means general. And if you are part of the, our general, all our people, of course I must ask you, that's my office. That's my work. And I must set everything right. And I must say, well, in that local government area, this is part of general supervision, superintending over the people. And if you know that is the case, you will not worry. In fact, you will be wondering. You will say, ah, pastor, I'm a district overseer. You don't even know me. And uh, our state overseer knows me. By the grace of God, I'm going on fine. But uh, you don't even know me. And you are general superintendent. And I think you ought to know me. You ought to know the work I'm doing. And then I say, what's your name? What are you doing? How is the work going on? Of course, if I rebuke you, tell me. The people that walk on the road, when the foreman said, who put this block here? And somebody ran and said, I am the person. And he said, you know, he graduated in engineering. Uh, you shouldn't have put the block there. Will he bring out his certificate and say, foreman, look at my certificate? Because he has uh, graduated. He has, uh, you know, a degree. Oh, he'll say, I'm sorry. That's why the foreman is there. Sometimes the foreman does not even have a degree, but he has the experience. He's been there now for 17 years. And because he's been there for a long time, he knows how the thing ought to be. And all the graduates, they will take the block away from there. And sometimes they are building a house in the construction. And the director or the foreman will come and say, who made all this concrete here? 
and already have spent thousands of naira on that concrete. And then the supervisor will say, that is not right, break it up again. They worked for about a whole week before they cast the concrete there. Now the supervisor says, break it down. And everybody, it may take them another whole day to demolish and to bring down what they are built for one whole day. Do they resign? Do they say, if the foreman will not allow that concrete we have cast to remain there, I'm resigning. That's what our people do. They have been doing something among the prayer warriors and we call them, ah, come. That's not how to lead in the prayer warriors. I, I fasted for three days uh, before we, you know, got deliverance for that person. We understand, but that's not the way. Change that thing. I resign. If that's how they are resigning in hospital, resigning in the, on the road, resigning in engineering company, resigning in the secondary school, resigning in the school board, uh, the world cannot continue in anything. Why will the world be better than the church? That the people of the world can endure. They understand supervision. And they will cleave unto their work. Whatever the correction. Whatever the superintending. Whatever the foresight that the people have. And the people in the church will say we have the grace of God. We say that we have the word of God. We say we believe in the Lord. A little rebuke. Yeah, the thoughts in your mind is that I will resign. I will resign. The people that cleave unto the Lord your God are alive. Every one of you, this day, what will keep you alive is that you cleave unto the Lord. Cleave unto the Lord. Abide by the word of God. All these words that you are learning, that we are teaching you, abide by the word of God. Then you will remain alive. You know, you learn something there. The people that do not cleave to the Lord, they are not alive. They may be breathing. They may still be preaching in other places. They may still be praying in tongues. They may still be doing whatever they like. The people that do not cleave unto the Lord, completely to the Lord, they are no more alive. Only the people that cleave unto the Lord are alive this day. Look at Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. From verse 11. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. He that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Because iniquity shall abound. You see, in the Christian world today, in Christendom, iniquity abounds. You'll be surprised there are people called Catholic Charismatics. Speaking in tongues, still worshipping Mary. Speaking in tongues, still using the rosary. Speaking in tongues, believing that Mary and Jesus are co-saviors. Believing that Mary will take their prayer to Jesus Christ. And then Jesus will take the prayer to God. Believing that you cannot live above sin. You must still take their transubstantiation. That is their bread and their wine. That they say is the literal body and the blood of Jesus. And they speak in tongues. Those are the people they call Catholic charismatics. And uh, the people will say, we are one now. Ah, deeper life, why do you remain separated? No, we are not separated. We are one with the true body of Christ. But we are not one with the apostate church. We are not one with the fallen church. We are not one with the people that are not keeping to the word of God. No, we are not separated. We are joined to Christ. We are joined to the people who are keeping the word of God. But we are separated from every false prophet. We are separated from the people that are deceiving themselves and they are not getting at the center, at the real nucleus of the Christian faith. We are separated from them because we do not want to live in their confusion, in their pollution. You see, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. You see, because um, of the generation, what is happening today, a lot of people, all they do now is sightseeing. 
you know they go here they go there they go a lot of places but they're wasting their lives you see this year many people they try to come and invite me come over here come over there i tell them directly some somebody came from america last uh, year december and said they will be expecting me they said thousands of people will be gathering together oh i said i'm sorry i cannot come and they would have paid for the flight they would do everything but i said that's not the point with me i cannot come he said why i said because i don't have any message for you uh, it, it was on a Sunday, in a Sunday meeting at Bagada. And we were just finishing the second service. I said, look at all these people as they are sitting down now. I said, anything I read from the Bible, I teach them, they receive it. I have a message for them. But America, I told him, white man, said in America, all you want is a new Cadillac, a new this, a new that. And if I preach that, I'll be encouraging covetousness. I can't preach it. I'm not, I don't have a message for you. He looked at me and he said, you are right. He said, this is what they have been doing before, but now they are changing. I said, well, change, when you finish changing, I might be able to come. You have not finished changing yet. But you see, many people, they are interested. This year, February, stroke March, I should have been in Singapore. And he got all the people together. They wanted me to come and share about large churches, how to grow large churches in Singapore and all that. I phoned the man. I said, I'm sorry. I cannot come. I'm doing an important work here. That's the word of Nehemiah. He said, I cannot leave this thing I'm doing here. You see, you are the greatest congregation I can preach to. Because if I teach you on holiness, you will accept. Why do I waste my life going to Singapore? And all I can talk about is people getting healed, people jumping up, people raising up their hands, people speaking in tongues. You speak on sanctification and holiness. Oh, they will say, we thought John Wesley has died. Yes, he has died, but holiness has not died. Sanctification has not died. The man is gone, but the Bible is here. But you see, they don't want it. All they want is how you can just fellowship with them. Somebody came from the full gospel in one of your states, and he says he's a member, and I wonder for the people that say they are deeper life, and they remain in that type of thing. It's like, you know, you, you are dividing the church into, because what we teach you is different from what they are telling you. And there are officers in those places in what they call the full gospel. And I told you on the other, on the other day, many of them, they don't preach up to one quarter gospel. And he came, he came to invite me. I said, I'm sorry, I cannot come. I don't have message for full gospel. I have only message for the people that will repent, make restitution, and follow after the Lord. You know why I'm doing that? I am trying to keep to the word of God until Jesus comes. You see, if you are mixing with, you mix with this, mix with that, mix with that, you will get into all these erroneous things. Erroneous things. Over here in Lagos, uh, they were going to have a crusade. And uh, they invited me to come this, to send my picture, to send this one to them, so that I will preach one night. A CAC evangelist will preach one night. A Ladura person will take one night. I, I said, count me out. I don't do that. I don't waste my life. That's a waste of time. That the people that need the gospel will be sharing the uh, pulpit together. I take one night, my picture is there, celestial man picture is there, Aladura uh, picture is there, and the CAC picture. I said, I don't do that. I said, I don't have time for that. There's too much for me to do. Too much. That, and we have a lot of people. The reason they don't want to stay in deeper life is that, well, they curtail our traveling. Well, nobody curtails my traveling, but the Bible curtails it for me. The Bible tells me where I ought to minister. It says, I should not cast my peers before swine, or cast the holy thing before dogs. And if those eat the swine, the people that will not take the word of God, if they are inviting you, come here, come there, come there, why are you disobeying Christ? And you cast your peers before swine. And there are, a lot of, there are a lot of people waiting for you in deeper life, in the local church, in the local government area, in the state capital. Your, your peer, you cast it before the people. They will dig, they will pray, they will cry, they will do everything. They will sell all that they have to be able to take the peer of great price from you. The people are there, you are not feeding them. 
the dogs that will trample over the pier and then turn back and tear you into pieces and call you names deeper whatever they are the people you want to run to what's the what's the reasoning behind that it's because the love of many is waxing cold the love of many waxing cold but it says he that shall endure unto the end the same shall be saved in jude verse 3 jude verse 3 beloved when i gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints that's how to endure until the end that's how to endure till the end that you should earnestly contend for the faith now when we talk about earnestly contending for the faith it's not talking about faith for healing faith for miracle it's talking about the whole christian doctrine earnestly contend for it you see today uh, there is a lot of watering down washing up of the real standard of the word of god and let me come back to this issue again the people that you know all they say they want to do is just worship the lord speak in tongues and some of the deeper life people you know it, it shocks me and surprises me even in our workers meeting here you talk a serious message on the flesh and the spirit you give a serious message on clean hands and a pure heart you give a serious message on breaking up your fallow ground you give a serious message on trust in man you give a serious message on fighting the good fight of faith you give a serious message on cleaning up our lives preparing for heaven and we say now rise up to pray instead of praying with their understanding they just begin to speak in tongues how will the speaking in tongues cleanse you all will speaking in tongues make the repentance for you decide on the restitution for you they do not understand there has been so much of infiltration from all these people selling books and distributing cases on deeper life that we are no more keeping to the centrality of the word of god look at first corinthians chapter 14. first corinthians chapter 14 verse 19 yet in the church i had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice i might teach others also than ten thousand words in an unknown tongue that is paul the apostle he said yes i have the experience yes i believe in the spirit yes i'm full of the spirit and i speak in tongues more than you all yet in the church yet in the church i had rather speak five words with my understanding so that by my voice in those five words i might teach others also and of course you teach yourself than ten thousand words in an unknown tongue what does he mean five words that are weightier than ten thousand words in speaking an unknown tongue for example, ye must be born again. Five words. Weightier, greater than speaking in tongues. Five words. Sanctify them through thy truth. Just five words. But it will carry you farther than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Go and sin no more. Just five words out of scripture. But that will carry you near the gate of heaven than ten thousand words in an un unknown tongue earnestly contend for the faith those are five words the five words that will make heaven to depend to defend you that will make heaven to be on your side hold fast till i come those are just five words five words of scripture five words of holiness five words that will make a man to be the person he ought to be i am crucified with with christ five words five words that will challenge your life change your life transform your life five words that will teach others also rather than all these you know ten thousand words in an unknown tongue 
lay your treasures in heaven. Those are five words. Five words that will be dynamic in your life. The five words that when you repeat those five words and you remember that, it will make you to be the person you ought to be. Reckon yourselves dead unto sin. Those are just five words. But these five words that I'm getting to you now from the scriptures, they are the words that will help your life. Rather than, you know, we just come into the church and talk, blah, 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 all the time, 10,000 words. It has no effect on your life. It gives you no authority. It gives you no power over sin. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Those are five words. Five words that will make your life what your life ought to be. Five words come out from among them. Strong words, five words. Rather than, you know, we just rise up and talk in tongues and talk in tongues and you are weak. You speak in tongues and yet you are not overcoming. You speak in tongues and yet you are not the fellow, the man, the woman that you ought to be. Touch not the unclean thing. Just five words. Five words that make you to know that you have decided you are going in the direction of heaven. It's not just that. You see, many people, they don't understand scriptures. And all the things they follow after, all these five words I'm telling you now from the word of God, they don't know them, they don't live by them, they don't consider them, they don't meditate on them. But you, if you want to make heaven your home at last, you will consider these five words of scriptures. Speak evil of no man. Just five words. Five words that will control your tongue. Five words that will control all your utterances, whatever is coming out of your mouth. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Five words that keep you clean all the time. And it says, hold, lay hold on eternal life. Five words that make you to understand that you are to make sure that eternal life doesn't depart from you. Be gentle unto all men. You see, if all these Pentecostals will consider what the Bible says, and they will keep on just to these five words that the Bible has given unto us, they will not just be living like they are living. Add to your faith virtue. Those are five words. There are five words from Scripture. Dynamic words that will make you live right. The Lord is at hand. Those are five words. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Five words that prepare you for the rapture. But you see, our people, they do not understand. And they follow after all these other people that will maybe dance or move or shake or stand or whatever. And pretending to know the word of God. But Paul the apostle said, I in the church. I had rather speak five words with my understanding. That by my voice I might teach others also. Than ten thousand words in an unknown tongue. And so, let's keep to the word of God. And let's keep on to this word until the end. In Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22. Verses 18 and 19. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things. God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things that are written in this book. The Lord is commanding us and telling us, we need to keep to the word until the very end. You don't take away from the word of God. You don't add to the word of God. You don't modify the word of God. Mutilate, destroy the word of God. You don't tear the word of God. You stand on the word of God at all times. Second Timothy chapter 4 from verse 1. 
I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. You know, people wonder, they say, Deeper life, you don't invite other people to your pulpit. Yes, because uh, we don't really need them. It's not too difficult for us to do what the Lord told us to do. Feed the flock of God. And the woman that complains about feeding the family three times every day, that's not a real wife, that's not a real mother. And brethren, those uh, sisters, your wives, will prepare the meal three times a day. And they do they get into more labor, into more work, to prepare the meals that many of us do in preparing the spiritual food for the church. They get to the market. Before they buy the foodstuffs, you just pick your Bible on your table. You don't have to travel to the market before you buy, before you get the bread of life from afar onto the people. Then when they come back, they sit in the kitchen in the heat. You don't have to sit in the heat before you prepare the spiritual food. You can stay in your study room or you can stay in your room or in the sitting room under the fire. And then they peel all the potato or all the yam or they pick the stone out of the rice. There's no stone to pick out from the word of God. It's just a matter of taking your concordance, taking the whatever will help you to be able to know all the references on the message you are preaching. You are not picking any stone. You are not washing anything. And they need to get all that into water, wash it up and then put it on the fire and they need to look for the match you don't need to look for any other fire the holy ghost resident in you is always there the fire of the spirit of god and he enlightens you and then stays in that hot kitchen until he makes the food available for you and then he does she does that in the morning in the afternoon in the evening we only do it some of us we do it just once on sunday or maybe some twice on Sunday. Maybe once on Tuesday. That's not too much. Once on Friday or Thursday. That's not too much. And so some of the people outside, they say, they, they challenge us. They say, you do not invite other preachers to come and preach on your pulpit. Yes, because we don't even have enough preaching yet. It's not, we don't find it too hard to preach to our people on Sunday. And when, if we can preach to our people on Sunday, why do I need somebody from afar? Who doesn't know my people? Who doesn't know their spiritual need? Who doesn't have the oversight over them? Who is not the one that has been commanded to feed the church? He should feed his church. You see all of them, they are running away from their churches. They are not feeding their churches. They want to come and feed our own church. Let them feed their church first and let us see the mark of the feeding on their church before they can come to our church and feed our people. If their people are starving, if their people do not have the word of life, why should they come to our home? If you don't feed your children, why do you want to feed my children? If you don't feed your own wife, why do you want to come and feed my wife? Feed your own children. I will feed my own children. And when we realize that, well, you will not be listening to these people. Oh, they say deeper life. They don't invite other preachers to come and feed their church. Thank you very much. We're feeding them. And the word of God we're giving them, has, we're not diluting it for them. And our wives are doing more feeding than we are doing. Because it's not too much for us. And you see that woman in the kitchen, she will stand there for a long time or sit down there for a long time. She doesn't complain. She might have been doing that now, preparing three meals every day. Every day of the week. How many times? You can calculate it. We don't preach so many times, 21 times a week. It's not too much. Not, it takes you just about 30 minutes, 45 minutes, one hour. Deliver the message to them and then preach to them. The primary school teachers who enter primary school from 8 o'clock in the morning until 1.30 in the afternoon. And they are teaching from one subject to the other. They don't invite other, other people to come and teach their students for them. 
They don't tell us, I have six classes to teach every day and for, from Monday to Friday or 30 classes. They stay there, they teach different subjects. They write notes of lesson. They don't call teachers from other places to come and teach for them. And if somebody came to visit them at school and, uh, you know, this is a friend and he is a teacher in his own school. He doesn't say, well, I'm glad you came today. I'm, I'm so tired now. I taught 30 classes last week. I taught 30 the other week. And I've, I've taught already 21 this week. And here you come. And today is, um, today is a Thursday. Uh, just take over for me and let me rest. Primary school teachers don't do that. All the years I taught in secondary school, I didn't need anybody's help. I would teach them during the, during the normal school session. Even on holidays, we tell them to wait for extension. And we teach them. When they are preparing for school, sir, the final exam, we teach them in the day, in the afternoon, and in the evening. We didn't call people from neighboring towns to come and help us teach them the mathematics. We taught them. How is it? Preachers today, we cannot preach all the four Sundays, all the five Sundays in the month. We cannot preach all the Bible studies in the month. We cannot preach all the revival hours in the month. I need help. What help do you need? Those of us who have taught in primary, in secondary, at university level, we didn't need any help. We just taught all the time. Oh, you say, when I teach, when I preach the Bible, I am drained. You don't have the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost is not drained. Because Jesus said, he that drinks of the water that I will give unto him, he will never thirst. Out of him will flow out rivers of living water. And when you have, when you have come and you have drunk at the fountain of living waters, and you have got the Spirit of God, how did you preach one message and you are drained? How did you preach three messages in a week and you are drained? It is because we do not know our responsibility, preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. You know, sometimes uh, our, we even do it among ourselves. If um, maybe a state overseer has come to another stage, ah, and we say, I'm glad you came. I'm so tired feeding my people. I'm so worked up and worked out and strained and drained feeding my people. And you are a state overseer. Take over my people. Teach them anything you like. Anything. We are together. Are you a real preacher? That state overseer is not the state overseer of that state. He has his own work. If he came to visit his family in your state, that's what he came to do. He didn't come to preach. If he came to visit your family, he came to visit your family. And you have the people, take the word of God, show your people that you are not tired. You see, I show my people here in Lagos that I'm not tired. Tomorrow, by the grace of God, I'm still preaching five services. Don't you get tired? Not when I'm preaching. When I'm sleeping, I get tired. When I lie on that bed all the time, many, many hours, I get tired. I say, when will it be morning? I wake up sometimes, I see that ah, it's only after two. When will it be five o'clock and I can get up and, you know, start all over again? You, you don't get tired when you have the Holy Ghost. You don't get tired when you know that the Lord is coming very, very soon. But the people say, oh, you are here now in our state. I'm so glad you came. Take it over. I never do that. I never do that. I keep on in the work. Oh, you say, you might die. I love that. You know, I love to die. After you have finished your work, you should go home. You don't remain on the farm after you have finished all your work and the, and the sun has set. You don't remain on the farm. Something will be wrong with you. When you finish your work on the farm, on the field, you go home. And when I finish my work on the field, I'm still on the field now. I'm still preaching the gospel. When the sun sets and the work is finished and, and I can say like Paul the Apostle, I am not ready to, and I'm, I'm not ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. At that time, I need to go home too. And therefore, you shouldn't worry about, well, what if you work too hard and you die? You don't die of hard work. You only die of laziness. Hard work doesn't kill anybody. 
And you see, my own father in the secular world, oh, my father, he rode on his bicycle long, long distances. Every day, he'll go from place to place. And when I was young, on holidays, I used to go with him. Sometimes we'll walk, sometimes we'll cross bridges, sometimes we'll cross rivers. We did a lot of work. We didn't die. He didn't die of hard work. He died of another thing. My mother, when she was very, when I was very young and I lived with her, oh, she walked, she walked, go to the market, go to the farm, go to the kitchen, go everywhere, real work. You know, when I was young, I didn't know about entertainment, I didn't know about dancing. Our family did not know about dancing, entertainment, television, all those things. All that our family knew is work, Anglican family. You see, we woke up in the morning, we read a little Bible, and in our family, you dare not sleep while my father is reading the Bible to you. If you sleep, he will leave the Bible and give you a thorough beating. And you mustn't cry because it's Bible reading. And uh, after he has beaten you like that, you wake up and you, you, you brush your eyes. You, if you sleep again, he will leave the... He, he was training me. Oh, it was training. It was training. But I didn't die. I didn't die. If all that beating and all the trouble did not kill me, preaching cannot kill a man. Why, why are you lazy? Why are you not doing your work? But, and preach the word in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. And the time has come. A lot of people cannot endure sound doctrine. But after their own laws, they will heap up to themselves teachers having itching ears. They invite that one from that place, invite that one from that place, come and be preaching to our people. And when the people come, they cannot say anything serious. All they will say is just encouraging the people, you are people of God. How grateful you should be. This Jesus Christ is powerful and we are his followers. They won't tell us how to be followers. They won't knock sin. They won't talk holiness. They won't talk purity. They won't talk the real word of God that will challenge people and make them to cry and make them to go on their faces before the Lord. All they will just come. That's not feeding the flock. Feed the flock. Teach the people. And it says they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. The Lord is telling us we must endure till the end in the doctrine. Keep the doctrine till the end. Keep the word of God till the end. Do it when it's convenient. Do it when it's not convenient. Keep to the word of God in your life, in your family, in the public, in the private, in the church, teach the word of God. And when you finish your work and you go home, God will receive you. Angels will rejoice because of you. They will know that you did what you ought to do until the very end. The end has not come yet. You are still in the midst of the battle. Keep on keeping on. Don't allow anything to drive you back. All the word of God you have been taught, keep on it until the very end. Endure till the end. Rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Endure till the very end. Pray in your own understanding. Tell the Lord what you have learned and to give you the grace. Tell the Lord to give you the grace. Stand on the word of God. Stay by the word of God. Endure till the end. In Jesus' name we pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank thee very much because we believe that before we came last Wednesday, you had us, you had us in mind. And we thank thee because you have not forgotten us because all that we needed you have supplied. We glorify thee because we have no regret coming to this place. You have prepared us for eternity. You have spoken to our hearts concerning enduring to the end. Father, we are praying. Many have come and have gone. Many have come and they have ended their race in sorrow. Father, we are praying that as many as are here today, we shall never end in sorrow in Jesus' name. 
today because God has been so faithful to me. I'm going to keep this very short. First of all, I want to thank God for the church. The church has been my family. Um, thank you so much, Pastor Dada. He has been a father to me. I don't start crying. Okay, um, I remember I came here without um, scholarship to Harvard University. The first year wasn't easy, but I got a grant that paid half of my tuition. But then from second year, I got like five different scholarships from my department. I'll be graduating in May. I didn't have to take out the board. I just thank God for all his provision. I just blessed you with grace.